This will be, I think, a, a shorter talk, uh, um, and it's really more light uh, than, than heavy in the sense that we're just simply trying to look at where, uh, or I guess more an opinion piece of where I think metabolomics is going. Uh, the idea is to sort of inspire you, to sort of, uh, I guess, suggest some things where you might want to explore, uh, but also to encourage you to explore. Um, so. Uh, over the last uh, 10 years, metabolomics has grown quite considerably. And this is just simply doing a PubMed search, looking at uh, terms uh, for uh, metabolomics, metabonomics, metabonome, and metabolome. Um, you could do a PubMed search right now, and you, you'll get very similar numbers. But it's actually growing exponentially, uh, which is quite something. The question is, where is it going to go after this? Uh, is it going to continue growing? Is it going to flatten out? Uh, or is it going to plummet? Um, and how it will proceed over the coming years is actually defined by where there are some critical bottlenecks um, in metabolomics that would either prevent it or allow it to, uh, to realize what its real potential is. So I think you guys have already seen the first bottleneck, which is um, in the case of trying to do uh, untargeted LCMS, uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, it's not particularly automated. Um, I think you can also see that there are real challenges with the level of coverage uh, that we get. I have brought up some of those points uh, in earlier lectures, but you can also see from whether it was the untargeted data or the NMR data or the GCMS data that you're typically working with uh, uh, 50 to a couple hundred compounds that are identifiable. Uh, metabolomics is really expensive to get into. Uh, I've mentioned a little bit to some of you, I guess, the, the Metabolomics Innovation Center, which is um, um, a center that I've been running for the last five or six years. Uh, NAMA is part of it. Jeff was involved with it in the early days. Um, it's based in Edmonton. It's distributed into different cities in, in Victoria and in McMaster uh, University in Hamilton and McGill University in Montreal. And altogether, there's $30 million of equipment um, that is in this center. Um, so it's not something that someone can just say, I'm going to do this tonight. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work to build out. It's a lot of work to maintain. Um, and so if that's the barrier to get into metabolomics, then it's, it's too big a barrier for most people. There's a central issue in metabolomics, which is about quantification. I've been emphasizing that, and you guys saw this as well, where we had quantified data for uh, targeted work, but for the untargeted work, um, all of the data is non-quantified. It's only relative. Another central issue with metabolomics is that you know, people are finding cool things all the time, but you know, are we actually seeing metabolomics being used in the clinic? Uh, are, are doctors showing up on TV advertising their metabolomic applications? And then I, I think the other key issue, especially with small molecules, is drug companies are the, are the elephant in the room. They are um, the ones with huge R&D budgets, they're the ones that often direct and decide where major initiatives should be. They're the ones that really said we should do genomics. They're the ones that said we should do proteomics. Uh, so if you can make metabolomics matter to drug companies, that also will help um, uh, sort of clear some bottlenecks. So those are bottlenecks. Uh, so there are some trends that are happening to essentially address those. One area people are working on is automating metabolomics. Another area people are working on are trying to expand the metabolome coverage. Another area is trying to make metabolomics more portable. Another area is obviously moving more towards quantification. Another area of active work is metabolomics moving from the lab to the clinic. Another one is trying to get metabolomics back into drug development and its discovery. So I'm going to talk about each of these points uh, over the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, and the first thing I'll just talk about is, is move toward automation. So this has already been hinted at. Um, so there are now um, more and more types of equipment that are automating uh, metabolomics. 
So I mentioned that the juice screener and wine screener, this is something that Brooker developed a number of years ago, well, four or five years ago. They've also got one that does lipid analysis uh, that came out last year. So these are NMR instruments. Um, can't even tell that there's a, a, a magnet in some cases. Um, but they're designed for doing very high throughput analysis and very automated analysis of wine and juice. So you can figure out the exact composition, their provenance, where they're from, which country, uh, which province or state uh, or region. Um, they can perform uh, HDL, LDL, VLDL lipid analysis as well automatically. Um, and it's, uh, it's a walk away turnkey instrument. Um, so you just have to load up samples and, and you can process hundreds a day. In the case of mass spectrometry, uh, there are kit companies like Biocrates, which will be uh, co-sponsoring tomorrow's symposium. Uh, Shimadzu, which is also moving towards this. Um, I believe AB Sciex also is trending towards this, where either the vendor or independent companies are selling kits for people to do uh, relatively automated high throughput quantitative metabolomics. Uh, there are also uh, many um, regional centers which uh, allow you to just send your samples in and get your answers back. So Metabolomics Innovation Center, TMIC is an example. There are six regional centers in the U.S. Uh, that allow that. There are regional centers appearing or national centers in Japan and the U.K. and in Holland and in France. Um, and then there are companies like Metabolon also where you can take your samples, send it in and automatically, well, a week later get your data back. So it does cost money, but there is a trend towards more and more automation. And if you tour some of these facilities, you'll see how they are trending towards automatic metabolomics. Um, we've also seen an example of not just the equipment that's being automated, but also the software. So you guys had a chance to use Basil, um, and you could see that you know it took a couple minutes. But if you tried to do this manually, uh, it would take all of you anywhere from half an hour to two hours to do some of the stuff with just a single spectrum. Um, so you know having it work in two to three minutes and having it process 20, 30, or 40 spectra uh, in a reasonable time and quite accurately is is I think an important advance. Uh, we've also been working in the area of GC Autofit. You guys have tried that. That's another example of automation. Um, and uh, again, most of you have given it a try. So it's not just the hardware, it's also the software. And um, it's happening not just in, in TMIC, the Metabolomics Innovation Center, but it's also happening uh, in other places in North America and in Europe and in Japan, where more software is being added. Now there's still a bottleneck, as you guys saw, with trying to do untargeted uh, metabolomics, but perhaps in a year, perhaps in two years, um, it'll be as automated as Basil or GC Autofit. I think that would be a really important advance. Okay, so that's a, a little spiel about automated metabolomics. Uh, how about expanding metabolome coverage? So this is a picture we've seen before, and it's just sort of highlighting uh, the number of metabolites or features that can be detected with different technologies and their sensitivity limits. So NMR, micromolar sensitivity, maybe about 100 compounds. DCMS, submicromolar sensitivity, maybe about 200 compounds. LCMS, um, nano, sub-nanomolar sensitivity, and, and thousands to tens of thousands of features. So obviously if we can go to more sensitive instruments, we can cover more compounds, but the dilemma for us, and as you guys saw, is that many of the features that we see through uh, LCMS methods are, are not identifiable. You guys have put in a bunch of masses. You saw some features that were important. Some of them hit something. Some of them didn't hit something. And, and in most cases, um, 85, 95 percent of the time, uh, the masses don't correspond to anything uh, that are in our database. So the question is, what are these unknown unknowns? And my belief, and I think a growing number of people are believing that these unknowns are actually metabolites of metabolites. These are transformation products of compounds that 
are already in our bodies or in plant bodies or other things. Um, where other <laughs> enzymes or other microbes or other processes are transforming them, changing them in, into something else that is not common in other pathways. This is a picture uh, that Augustin has, has been using in his lectures. It came from a paper that we wrote together about uh, the food metabolome, or essentially exposures, and whether it's exposures that we get from uh, our diet, or exposures from drugs, or exposures from pollutants. These all constitute either the pollutant metabolome, the drug metabolome, the food metabolome, or the endogenous metabolome. And these are quite diverse. And the reason why they're diverse is that the compounds that are at the top are often ones that we already know. We have lists of all the known drug components. We have pretty comprehensive lists of all the chemical components in foods and the food additives. We also have very comprehensive lists of what are, are released into the environment in terms of chemicals, the pollutants. But when these things go through microbial metabolism, house metabolism, whether they're digested or even if they're just processed through UV light or sitting on water or microbes in the soil, they get transformed. And they get transformed kind of into a green goop that we don't know about. Uh, and that's what we see with these increasingly sensitive instruments. So how can we actually characterize these things? In order to be able to have constant identification in these compounds, we would have to uh, have authentic standards for them. So whether it's 100,000 uh, unknowns, 500,000 unknowns, and my own calculation suggests it could be up to half, <coughs> up to 5 million unknown compounds. So to be able to synthesize 5 million compounds, to characterize 5 million compounds by NMR, to collect MS and GCMS spectra for 5 million compounds, that would cost anywhere between 5 and 10 billion dollars. So the Human Genome Project was done for about two or three billion dollars, and so these days no one's going to put that much money into sort of the, the chemical genome project. So what's the solution? If we can't get these authentic standards, if we're never going to have the chemical libraries, if we're never going to have the reference spectra, what should we do? So the uh, task now, I think, is to move from trying to do it in, in you know, the slow, tedious way of synthesizing and characterizing pure compounds for libraries but to go to in silico metabolomics. And this is the idea of performing systematic spectral prediction for the compounds that we think exist or we know exist. Um, so there's lots of compounds, but many of them don't have their spectral uh, spectra collected. Many compounds that we know of at one time, but the spectra were collected 30 years ago and they haven't been updated, and so that's kind of useless. So this goes back to this concept of CFMID, uh, but there's also uh, programs like METFRAG and METFUSION. Uh, these are programs that can take a picture of a compound and predict the MSMS spectra or the EIMS spectra. There are also <laughs> tools that we're working on to predict the NMR spectra of uh, compounds in water. And there are also concerted efforts to try and predict the metabolism of compounds just from their starting uh, components. So whether it's tools to predict spectra or tools to predict metabolites of metabolites, these are coming on stream fairly quickly. And these may, in fact, become the new reference materials for both the expected compounds as well as their expected reference spectra. So this will be, I think, an important way of expanding coverage, of covering those unknown unknowns, of getting uh, assignments to all those mystery peaks that, that uh, Nama generated from her uh, XMS analysis. Um, we'll see. It may not yet work as we'd hoped, but it, it is already proving to be useful. There are a number of people that have been using spectral prediction methods to actually uh, identify novel compounds. And there are a number of people who have been starting to use uh, predicted transformations to confirm and also provide hypotheses for novel compounds. Um, so that's, I think, another way of addressing the expanding bottleneck, uh, expanding metabolome co coverage bottleneck. 
The other one that I think is, is very challenging for metabolomics, um, it's challenging for proteomics, it's challenging for genomics. It's expensive to do these things. You can't do it at home. Uh, you can't do it in the field. You have to bring samples back into an expensive lab that's very sterile. But one of the things that is happening is that people are moving more and more towards portable devices. Um, so some of you might have Fitbits or have tried them. Uh, there are things called sensors and other kinds of tools that are like um, uh, portable devices to monitor your health, uh, that can measure your blood pressure and, and body temperature. Uh, they can even do some small chemical analyses. And so this concept of trying to democratize metabolomics to convert uh, a 900 or gigahertz NMR instrument which would fill this room and two stories above us to something that you could hold in your hand is, I think, the best way of democratizing metabolomics. It's something that everyone could afford, everyone could do, it could be in every lab, it could be in the field, it could be in the farm. Um, and so this idea of, of making um, a handheld system that could kind of scan up and down your body and tell you what's in in you is is actually not a, that absurd. So Qualcomm has just finished or wrapped up their X Prize for a tricorder, and it was actually awarded to a, a family firm in the U.S. Uh, and I think the Canadian group finished third in the X Prize competition to make essentially handheld medical devices that can measure or do a small amount of clinical chemistry, but also measure things like heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, and other things. So, you know, if a family firm uh, working in their basement can win a $5 million X prize, it certainly suggests that the technology is starting to appear for doing miniaturizing of metabolomics. Uh, it's possible to do capillary electrophoresis on a chip. It's possible to do HPLC on a chip. It's possible to do gas chromatography on a chip. And these are small chips, uh, and these are commercially available. Um, it's also possible to get uh, equivalent to electronic noses for small molecule detection. Um, and these two are not much larger than a credit card machine. Uh, and they can, through various combinations of pattern recognition, distinguish between acetone, benzene, chloroform. Uh, these are chemicals. They're volatile chemicals, but they are um, metabolites, if you want, or chemicals of utility uh, for metabolomics. Um, so this is another trend towards miniaturizing um, chemical analysis. We've been working in Edmonton at the Metabolomics Innovation Center uh, and with colleagues as well um, on trying to develop protein and RNA DNA aptamer mediated metabolite sensing. Uh, and the concept here is to, to basically make use of um, proteins that bind metabolites specifically uh, and to sort of carry out uh, competitive binding assays. So there are, in fact, whether they're paraplasmic binding proteins or antibodies, quite a number of proteins that are known to bind metabolites. Now, if you tag a metabolite with something like a gold nanoparticle or a fluorescent latex bead, you can actually carry out some kind of competitive assay. You can get compounds that bind, or if you've got the free compound, they can displace the gold nanoparticle uh, from the protein. When you're working with gold, you can actually start doing a bunch of things with relatively low-cost sensors. You can use surface plasma and resonance, surface enhanced Raman scattering, or you can look at electrical impedance. Uh, because once the gold is displaced, these things change quite dramatically. So if you've got proteins that are, that are specific to metabolites, and there's lots of them, then you can start making these kinds of handheld sensors. So working with colleagues at the University of Alberta in electrical engineering, we've been developing this uh, impedance-based metabolite sensor. Um, and Reza has been involved with this work for a while. And so it uses either antibodies or uh, paraplasmic binding proteins, conjugated uh, metabolites, and a very, very small uh, impedance sensor equipped with a very small, inexpensive chip. The target is to be able to measure eight to ten metabolites at a time with different chips and to have the chips cost about uh, one to two dollars a piece. 
So there are other people looking at miniaturizing metabolomics, but I think this is something that would, would make it much more accessible to a much wider community. Now the other thing that I've been emphasizing, and I think some of you have started to appreciate, is, is the utility of having quantified data for metabolomics. Again, we tried to give you guys a flavor for uh, untargeted uh, metabolomics, which gives you relative quantitation or semi-relative quantification. We've given you GCMS and NMR metabolomics, which gave you absolute quantification. There's a, a cover of uh, trends in biotechnology um, article, that, or actually it was actually for the entire journal, uh, it came about three years ago. And it, it had this title, uh, a specter is hunting metabolomics, specter being ghost, specter of quantification. And two or three years ago at the time when this was published, more than 90% of the published metabolomic studies were basically semi-quantitative, people reporting relative peak areas, relative intensities. Less than 10% of the published metabolomic st studies were using absolute quantification. Absolute quantification is key to reproducibility, and since this was published, uh, a major crisis has appeared in all of science, which is the crisis of reproducibility. Most science is not reproducible. And the reason why is largely because people are not being careful with quantitation. Uh, they are not doing absolute quantitation. And the one or two fields where things are really reproducible is typically physics, where they're doing precise measurements of mass or um, the uh, characterization of various leptons and bosons, where they have to be very precise. But in genetics and genomics and transcriptomics and proteomics, people are happy if they just get a set of values, which they report and only works in their lab. And if you go on any other platform, any other lab, you'll get a completely different set of values. Metabolomics has its origins in analytical chemistry. And analytical chemistry, historically, was the most quantitative science in, in all of the fields of science. It was about reproducibility. It was about having standards. It was about reporting absolute concentrations in millimolar and micromolar and molar. It's also important that if you want to do um, practical applications in clinical work, in environmental work, environmental monitoring, um, in uh, any form of veterinary work, what you report has to be reproducibly quantitative. So there are efforts. Uh, with several companies. We've already mentioned Biocrates, Brooker, I've mentioned Konomics, uh, which is an Edmonton-based company. Um, they've all moved towards quantitative tools for absolute quantitation. Um, there's a number of academic efforts, uh, whether it's things like Basil and Batman and GC Autofit. You guys have tried a few of those. These are also trying to encourage people to do absolute quantitation. And when you compare metabolomics, actually, in terms of its record for quantification, it's actually not so bad. Uh, people have been characterizing serum and plasma. They've been characterizing cerebral spinal fluid. They've been characterizing urine for many, many years. And metabolomics, to date, um, has absolutely quantified, not relative, but absolute, uh, about 200, almost 300 compounds in serum plasma. 175 in CSF, about 400 compounds in urine. Now, Metabolon can claim to have identified, I don't know, 1,200 compounds, but those are not absolutely quantified. They're, they're relative quantifications. In terms of proteomics, um, the number of proteins fully quantified uh, is now probably a little over 73. It's, it's closer to about 100. Uh, in CSF, there's been 130 proteins fully identified and quantified in urine 63. In transcriptomics, um, because every measure, whether it's RNA-seq or microarray, is relative, there has actually never been fully quantitative data reported on genes. So proteomics, which is 
25 years old genomics, transcriptomics, which is 20, 25 years old, and metabolomics, which is usually considered to be about 10 years old. Um, given its late start, it's actually done remarkably well in terms of quantification. But a lot more could be done because we know that in serum and plasma there's probably 20,000 metabolites. In CSF there's also probably 10,000. In urine there could be uh, 50 to 100,000 metabolites. Um, so we're only getting a partial coverage. Uh, so a lot more could be done, um, but a lot already has been done towards quantification. If more people were doing quantification, I think we'd do a lot better. So quantification is a bottleneck that's being cleared, um, but not entirely. And I think another one that's really important in, in moving the ball forward is moving metabolomics from, from the lab to the clinic, or from lab to practice. It doesn't have to be medical practices, it could be environmental, uh, it could be in the area of veterinary science, it could be in the area of, of plant science. In the case of clinical studies, um, a lot of them have focused on biomarkers. And over the last uh, 45 years, there have been more than 700,000 biomarker studies or papers that have been published. But of those, fewer than 250 have actually been approved for clinical use. And that includes protein biomarkers, genetic biomarkers, metabolite biomarkers. Interestingly, with proteomics, uh, there hasn't been uh, a, a protein biomarker proved using mass spec. Uh, almost all of them use ELISA. Um, there have been five biomarker tests that were used using gene chips or transcriptomics. But one of the things I think a lot of people aren't aware of is that uh, if you're under the age of 25, you've probably had a metabolomic test. And, and we brought this up earlier, which is remarkable uh, given that it just doesn't get any traction. People don't mention metabolomics as being sort of the universal test that everyone has had. And I think I also gave you some of these statistics as well, which is metabolomics, even though it's a late comer, is moving into the clinic. Um, and it's more so in the area of clinical chemistry. So if you tally up the total number of uh, metabolites that are measured, uh, at least in Canadian labs, and that are reported, it's a little over 320. Um, if you tally up the total number of genes that are approved for genetic testing in Canada, uh, it's about 130. If you look at the total number of protein tests that use ELISA, it's 108 that are approved in Canada. I've mentioned the gene chips, five. And then there was one proteomic test that was approved, but then um, it was moved to an ELISA. So it's back down to zero. So metabolomics is moving into the clinic because in fact it's a, a lot of these tests are relatively quantitative and that's been what's hold, held back transcriptomics, it's what's held back proteomics. In ELISA's, the assays are relatively quantitative. And in genomics, it doesn't necessarily have to be quantification. It just simply say the mutation is an A to a T or a G to a C, and so it's important or not important. But that, too, you could say is reasonably quantitative. But given the, the relatively small investment that's gone on to metabolomics, which is actually less than 1% of the investment that's gone into genomics, and less than 5% of the investment that's gone into proteomics, metabolomics has actually done pretty well. So not only for a small amount of money, but for a relatively short period of time, it's actually made those translation to clinical practice um, quite well. If we're looking at biomarkers, uh, you can sort of compare how metabolomics does uh, to some of the other methods, but also just in terms of um, certain conditions to, to explore. So you guys were working a little bit today with um, data that we'd had from preeclampsia, looking at mothers at three months into their pregnancy, and then looking to see if we could predict which mothers would actually have preeclampsia uh, later on. And um, Using metabolomics, we saw we were able to get an area under the curve of about 0.94 to 0.96. Um, 
So that's an example of preeclampsia. You can also do the same for late preeclampsia, looking at serum metabolites. Uh, you can get areas into the curve, rock curves, uh, for diagnosing uh, heart defects, again, well above 90%. You can even do sort of genetic testing for an infant at three months uh, into gestation to identify which ones have trisomy 21 or trisomy 18. So this is typically before you can do amniocentesis, and this is just simply looking at metabolites. We also had an example where you guys were looking at cachexia uh, of people with colon cancer and lung cancer, and when you use that data, it's also possible to get rock curves that are above 80-85% in terms of predicting which individuals will develop uh, cachexia. So if you can predict when people might get a disease, then often you can prevent it. So in the case of preeclampsia, a very simple preventative treatment is to use aspirin. In the case of cachexia, uh, changes in, in terms of dietary consumption of fatty, certain fatty acids and certain amino acids also seems to slow it down or prevent it. In terms of diagnosing diseases, metabolomics also is a very good tool. Um, these are some examples, again, from the TMIT group in Edmonton, where we've looked at um, uh, using uh, urine samples to diagnose kidney rejection. So currently, if you're, trying, if you're monitoring someone who's had a kidney transplant, you actually have to stick a giant needle in their back and take a chunk of the kidney out and analyze it through histology. So it's pretty painful and it happens a lot, especially right after uh, treatment or if there's been a difficult um, a bout of some certain disease. So if you could just have people uh, have a urine sample and determine whether there's a rejection happening, then again, it's easy to diagnose and actually easy to treat. Obviously, a urine sample is a lot less painful than a giant needle in your back. Um, works well for pediatric cases. It also seems to work well with um, heart failure. Uh, there seems to be some metabolic tendencies that have been seen not only by our group but other groups in Australia to diagnose chronic fatigue syndrome, which is very hard to identify. Eosinophilic esophagitis, another one that seems to be di diagnosing quite well. And one that we, I guess, are, are quite proud of, this is involving uh, operations with a, a company in Edmonton called Metabolomics Technologies Incorporated. Um, they developed an NMR assay uh, to take uh, urine samples <laughs> and to distinguish people who have colonic polyps from those that don't. So polyps are the precursors to colon cancer. And currently the best way to characterize uh, whether someone has colon cancer or polyps is to have a colonoscopy. And if you've ever known anyone who's had one or if you've had one yourself, uh, they are rather painful and they're also um, quite elaborate, so you're basically out of commission for about two days. You have to change your diet before the colonoscopy. You also have to recover uh, for about a day or more after the colonoscopy. And if all the gastroenterologists could have their way, everyone would have a colonoscopy every two weeks sort of thing. Um, so obviously it's too expensive to do that. Obviously, I mean, the typical colonoscopy is about five or six hundred dollars in Canada. In the U.S., it's maybe a thousand. Uh, it's a money maker, um, but that's not exactly how health systems want to work. If you have just a simple urine test that could pick up the polyps, or at least screen the people who seem to likely have the polyps, then it'd be a whole lot cheaper. So we worked with them to develop, a, a, a convert the urine test, which used 12 metabolites, to a mass spectrometry-based test that uses three metabolites. And that was successfully done. And um, because it's using multiple metabolites, we can adjust the sensitivity and specificity of the, of the test. So it's now been picked up by several companies in the U.S., which are now using it to screen patients for colonoscopies um, or not. So this is one of the first examples of a multi-metabolite marker moving into the clinic. Um, now, those are some trends. We've talked about automation, expanding metabolite coverage, making metabolomics more portable, efforts to quantify, moving metabolomics in the lab in the clinic. So some of these things are starting to happen. I've tried to give you some examples, but more needs to happen. And I think another area where more needs to happen is, is trying to get metabolomics into drug discovery and development. 
the history of metabolomics is that it was first used in drug discovery and development. It started in Imperial College and it was a pitch to drug companies. But relatively quickly they decided to abandon metabolomics. It was called metabonomics back then. Uh, partly because it wasn't quantitative, uh, partly because it wasn't portable, partly because it didn't cover things, and partly because it wasn't automated. So now that we're getting closer to automation, expanding the coverage, making things a little cheaper or more portable, that we're quantifying, and that there are clear examples of where metabolomics has now moved from the lab into the clinic, I think it's time for the drug companies to start thinking seriously about metabolomics. So if you look at drug discovery and drug development, um, the cost uh, and time to take a drug from concept to, to final product is about 10 to 12 years and anywhere from 800 million to 1.2 billion dollars. Interestingly, there are different phases where drug um, technologies are needed. So the first phase is discovery, typically chemistry is involved. Um, discovery in phase one analyses is often work with genomics and proteomics. But in fact, metabolomics is needed at just about every phase of the drug development process. And this is illustrated here. So in many cases, people are finding drugs uh, through metabolomics. They're finding drug targets, and in some cases they're finding natural products that seem to be effective in fighting or in some cases causing disease. So once you've got a drug lead identified through metabolomics, then you can also use some of the automation that's been developed to identify uh, toxicity for the drug. So that can be done on mice and rats. Um, and then there can also, metabolomics can be used to assess um, efficacy biomarkers. So you think the drug is working, well let's see if it actually changes things. And so you can start looking and using metabolomics to find uh, these efficacy markers. Um, then you can also use um, metabolomics to use uh, to assess preclinical safety or to look at toxicology, particularly as you move from animals to humans. And then as you move to later phases in the drug development, you'll look at clinical safety and clinical efficacy markers. So an example of this would be here, where generally when you do clinical trials in phase two and phase three, you recruit a bunch of people and you tell them, take these drugs, but do not take them with alcohol. And everyone will come and say, yeah, I didn't take uh, any alcohol and, and you know, I've taken the drugs. And then they'll analyze people and they say, well, obviously you didn't get any better or there isn't any response or you're sicker now. And they're stumped. But if they could actually analyze people's blood or urine and to look for things, you could actually see, in this case, this person, even though they said they didn't take alcohol, they did. Um, and so this is a way of monitoring compliance for um, clinical trial patients. And it's often a case that just one or two outliers in a clinical trial can destroy a billion dollar drug effort. <coughs> you can also um, look at individuals in these clinical trials to figure out whether people are slow metabolizers or fast metabolizers. Um, some people um, will take drugs and, and will metabolize them very, very quickly, and in fact, it seems like the drug has no effect. Um, I am a rapid metabolizer of caffeine, um, so if I try and drink uh, a lot of Coke and coffee uh, right before bed, I will promptly fall asleep. Um, our other people, I imagine, are um, slow metabolizers, and in fact, a, a cup of coffee, even at four in the afternoon, will keep them up all night. So this is something that you know differs with individuals, and, and it's a very much a function of uh, their physiology as well as their uh, genetics. But you can't predict purely from genetics, and you can't predict purely from physiology. The best way to see this is through metabolomics. So in terms of traditional drug discovery, there's a model that's been developed and used probably for the last 10 or 15 years. A lot of techniques are based on doing large-scale uh, studies, sometimes with genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. Um, they, the idea was to hopefully identify you know, genetic variants that were seeming to cause certain disorders. Um, in many cases, only uh, 
10% of, of disorders or disease actually have a genetic basis or a clear one. So typically the GWAS studies are only leading to about a 1 in 5 or 1 in 10 success rate. They're big, they involve tens of thousands of people, so they cost millions of dollars and they often take multiple years. Once they've found potentially a target gene, then the gene has to be druggable. Um, and in some cases the gene is not druggable. And even if the gene is druggable, then the protein target is not amenable for drugging. So usually they lose about half to the druggability issue or half to the protein uh, issue. So once they've finally isolated the protein target that they want to drug, then they start doing high throughput screening. And the typical success rate for that is about one in five of the protein targets they put into their system leads to a potentially uh, high nanomolar affinity drug. So one in five success, that screening process can take anywhere from one to five years. But then to take that drug lead and actually try and get it into uh, phase one preclinical phase two trials, uh, that's where it costs a billion dollars, that's where it costs or takes 10 to 15 years, and that's where the actual ultimate success is only one in 500. Once the drug is formally approved, there's about a, a one, well maybe it's not quite 50 percent, um, but a reasonably um, uh, high probability that in fact the drug will be taken off the market um, because it has or proves to be ineffective or too toxic. So even approved drugs are regularly pulled. So if you add the 1 in 5, 1 in 2, or multiply 1 in 2, 1 in 2, 1 in 5, 1 in 500, 1 in 2, you end up with uh, essentially from a beginning GWAS study to the point where you have a final product of 0.001% of getting a drug to the market. It's going to take 20 years and cost more than a billion dollars. That's largely why many drug companies um, have stopped their drug research. It's also why really all we're seeing now are copycat drugs coming from pharma companies or why um, we're seeing a lot of drug companies merging with each other because they can't sustain this. On the other hand, you could think of trying to use metabolite-based drug discovery. So metabolite-wide association studies, MWAS, actually can be done with a much smaller cohort because metabolites are the canaries of the genome. They're more sensitive. So you can actually do a pretty decent metabolomic study for a couple hundred thousand dollars. And in our case, and I think in many other labs, people have found very good and very useful uh, markers, but also probable targets that suggest that if this metabolite is reduced, or if this one is increased, or if this protein is made so it could uh, increase these levels of metabolite, there would be a positive response. You guys have seen some of how quick it is possible to analyze your data, your metabolomics data. You did it this afternoon. So whether it's a few hours to a few days, you've also done some pathway analyses which help identify some of the proteins or pathways you want to target. Um, you can use some of the databases we've talked about uh, to, to learn a little bit more about those pathways and processes. And in many cases, if it's a case that there's a short uh, shortage of a metabolite, or in other cases there's an excess of a metabolite, um, it's possible to simply substitute for that compound uh, or to find um, certain types of, of uh, proteins or enzymes that may modify that metabolite level. Um, if uh, you're wanting to see whether this is actually making a difference, then you can do metabolomics to monitor. So in these cases, it's possible to go from, uh, you know, 15 to 20 years and a billion dollars to do something where you've got a possible or probable uh, compound that's maybe even being used in the clinic uh, in, in less than a couple years and having sex rates of about 15 percent. And as I said, we've done this with um, colonic polyps and it's also suggested some other routes for treating a couple of disorders uh, that we've been working on. And there's been some really interesting examples elsewhere, not just in our labs, but um, in Stan Hazen's group. So this is an interesting story, um, and uh, this grew out of the Cleveland Clinic. 
um, with work that they were looking at with people who exhibited heart disease and atherosclerosis. And it's generally well known that people who have atherosclerosis um, typically have had uh, high fat diets. They've all their lives, typically they're obese, typically they have a record of consuming fatty foods, lots of cheese, egg, and meat. Uh, but not everyone develops that. Uh, and there are actually large populations uh, that have very fatty diets, but have very low levels of cardiovascular disease. Um, and, and in particular, over the last 30 or 40 years, people have been very interested in the incidence of heart disease in France and Italy, uh, Spain and other countries where consumption of eggs, milk, cheese um, is very high and total fat consumption is much higher than in many other countries but cardiovascular disease is very low. So why is it that some people are able to avoid heart disease or atherosclerosis and others, particularly in North America, seem to have high levels of cardiovascular disease? So what they found was that with people with, with atherosclerosis, they had high levels of trimethylamine oxide in their blood. Now TMAO is also something that you'll find in the urine at fairly high levels uh, if you eat fish, so it's a marker of fish. But normally it doesn't persist for long in the blood. And so they found these persistently high levels of TMAO uh, in about 2011 was when they first reported it, and they've re reproduced this in multiple studies. Uh, we've also seen it in, in others. Um, and then they tried to go back and look at these pathways and to try and understand it. So here's the lead. What's it meaning? So they traced it back and said, well, trimethylamine actually comes back from trimethylamine, trimethylamine oxide. So trimethylamine is a precursor for trimethylamine oxide. Uh, trimethylamine oxide, TMAO, is produced in the liver, but trimethylamine is produced in the gut. Where does trimethylamine come from? Well, it generally comes from uh, choline or other uh, tertiary amines, uh, which are generally produced from fatty foods, uh, fast phosphatidylcholine. <coughs> so here you've got an interesting link between what you eat what's in your gut, which converts the phosphatidylcholine to choline to trimethylamine, and then what your liver does. So they started out this pathway relatively quickly, just like you guys would do from, you know, KEG or HMDB or SNPDB. And then and they said, okay, where should our drug target be? Well, should we target the liver so it doesn't convert TMA to TMAO? Or should we target the microflora so it doesn't convert choline to TMA? Or should we target uh, people's diets and just tell them to stop eating fats? So the fat drug didn't work, and then they tried the liver drug, and that proved to be too toxic. And then they said, well, let's try and look at the bacteria and see if we can change that. So in 2012, they other and other groups started characterizing a, a particular enzyme that's found only in sulfate-reducing bacteria. And these bacteria are not in everyone, although they tend to be uh, relatively high abundance in people in North America. And the enzyme that's produced by these bacteria is called choline TMA lyase. So it converts choline into trimethylamine. So if you have these bacteria in your gut, you will tend to have high levels of TMA. Uh, if you don't have these bacteria in your gut, you will not have high levels of TMA. So then they said, well, now we've got our drug target. Can we start uh, screening it to see if we can find compounds that stop TMA lyase? So they started dumping all kinds of different things on them. And one of the things they found that really worked very well at stopping TMA lyase is something called 3,3-dimethylbutanol. So these are the structures. So there's choline above, and there's 3,3-dimethylbutanol. It looks a lot like choline. So in fact, it's a very good inhibitor. So where do you find 3,3-dimethylbutanol? You find a lot of it in extra virgin olive oil, in grapes, and in red wine, uh, which are sort of the characteristic features of the Mediterranean diet, which is what you eat a lot of when you're in Italy and France and Spain. 
And so it seems to have a, a really interesting uh, effect or potential where A, here's metabolomics finding a marker, B, identifying a pathway, <coughs> C, identifying a drug target, D, identifying a potential inhibitor, and then finally pointing out to a rationale why certain populations have relatively low heart disease and why other populations have relatively high levels. So with that, I think I'll, I'll wrap up here, but um, what I've tried to identify are some of the bottlenecks that um, are limiting metabolomics, uh, the lack of automation, the relatively limited coverage, the fact that it's expensive to get into, the fact that historically it's been non-quantitative, the fact that it hasn't really moved from the clinic, or at least we didn't know it was moving from the lab to the clinic, and then the potential or the limit applications of metabolomics to drug development and discovery. What I've then tried to do, I think, is then identify areas where, in fact, it is happening, where you are seeing automated metabolomics, where you are seeing expanded coverage, where you are seeing metabolomics becoming more portable, more quantifiable, and where there are plenty of examples of, of metabolomics going from the lab to the clinic, and where there are nice examples of how metabolomics is helping with drug discovery. And so what I'm hoping is that you could be uh, messengers, that in fact metabolomics is not sort of this obscure science that's leading nowhere. And in many respects, in fact, it's probably more automatic than many other omics methods. It's moving more rapidly, expanding more rapidly, that it is the most quantitative form of omics technology, that it is already successfully translated to the clinic over and over and over again, more so than any other omics field, and that it is having, I think, a significant impact in the field of drug discovery and development. So be happy that you're actually uh, in the field of metabolomics or that you're interested in. I think it's, it's a burgeoning field, and, and it could take you a long ways if you want to stick with it. So with that, I think we'll wrap up the course, and I'll thank everyone for listening in, attending, and working really, really hard.